Mariah. Lower Mariah. one. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome back. <laughs> Andrew, how are you doing today? <laughs> good, good. Yeah, uh, been covering some pretty good magic here uh, at the uh, MXP twenty K. Um, we uh, and this round, I think we've got another pretty nice match lined up for you. Hmm. You are correct. Uh, mono black, Warren Soul Trader combo deck. This is an interesting one. Uh, I remember reading a little bit about this, but I've actually not played it. Why don't you tell us how the combo works? Sure. I mean, fundamentally, the deck is just a three-card combo deck. If you assemble Warren Soul Trader, Marionette Apprentice, and Gravecrawler, uh, you can repeatedly sack Gravecrawler to make a token, sack a token to recast the Gravecrawler. Your opponent takes damage every iteration. Uh, you do lose life for the Soul Trader, but because your opponent takes pings, both for sacrificing the treasure and for sacrificing the grave crawler, you can kill them even if you have a lower life total them. Unless life total discrepancy is really large, this is going to be lethal. Uh, you can also execute the same combo with Goblin Bombardment instead of the Marionette Apprentice, uh, which Henry Mayo does have a few copies of. And if you do it that way, you do have to have a, life, a higher life total, but it still works just fine. Uh, this deck, it's been kind of around. It's been I don't know a, a tier two, tier three player kind of in the modern metagame since MH3. I haven't really had a big breakout finish or kind of a, a single player advocating for it, but it's definitely a powerful strategy, does some interesting things. Um, a deck to watch in the post-bit metagame for sure. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the table, uh, we're going to be seeing a Hollow One deck. We will be seeing Rakdos Hollow One. Uh, this is mostly the deck list that has been popularized by Aspiring Spike in recent weeks. It is playing the Detective Phoenix Nethergoyf Shell that plays so well with the classic Burning Inquiry Goblin Lore Hollow One Flame Blade F synergies you've come to know and love. This is a spicy deck. Goblin Lore, Burning Inquiry, a bunch of creatures that benefit from discarding or being discarded themselves. Uh, Nethergoyf is an interesting addition to this archetype. Um, this, this is going to be fun. I, I am excited for this. I mean, the deck is mostly a throwback. I mean, I fondly remember the days when Hollow One was a tier one strategy in modern. It, it was it was around the KCI era. Uh, famously, Ben Hall, I believe, uh, won a pro tour, uh, the team pro tour, playing Hollow One. Uh, you know, it's, it's a deck with some pedigree. It's fallen out of favor, didn't get any new upgrades for a while, but I think there is a certain amount of optimism around the Detectives Phoenix around using Texas Phoenix from the graveyard to give those hollow ones plus two plus two haste and fly, and uh, hoping that's enough to make your deck able to compete again. Okay, uh, we're looking at Flame Blade Adept and Stitcher Supplier staring each other down. Well, I don't, I don't know if we do that much staring, given that the Flame Blade Adept has menace. That is true. Miles coming over. Or some damage. Shout out to Henry Romero. He's a he's a, he's a Pacific Northwest native. I'm from Portland. I used to battle with and against him all the time. Uh, used to go to a handful of pro tours between like 2011 and 2016. Very good player. Miles at 18 from a shot clan. Now down to 17 from Stitcher Supplier. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, what just happened is weird. Miles' turn two apparently was cast nothing. Okay, Miles' deck is almost all cheap cards. Like, he doesn't have anything that is cost one three. So if I'm Henry Romero, I basically know there's Bowmasters coming, right? It has to be Bowmasters. Yes. Yeah, that, that couldn't be more Telegraph at all. Let's see it. Yeah, I, I do see Bowmaster being thumbed to the front here. Miles is just doing the last double check. That's how he wants to spend his turn. It is. Plays the Bowmasters. Kills the Supplier. Having those a few cards. Hmm. Are we going to not kill Stitcher Supplier instead? Just send it upstairs? Oh, maybe he's trying not to mill Henry into Gravecaller, knowing that's one of his key combo pieces. Interesting. I mean, he can do that for a while. In, in the long run, I think probably this fire is going to hit the graveyard, 
but maybe buying a little time is all he needs. Also, because we just got to look at Miles' hand, his hand looked incredible to me. I believe he has Burning Inquiry and Hollow One lined up, or as lined up as he can be when you might discard the Hollow One at random. Um, <laughs> Who knows? Nobody knows. Uh, that's Spymaster's Vault on Henry's side. Um, but instead, we're going to just cast a Bowmasters of his own, take Miles' Bowmasters off the battlefield, and make an Orcus army. Yeah. So, Miles has also has now picked up the Detective Phoenix. Uh, that's, that's a great pickup. He can bestow that for one mana. That said, because it can be bestowed from the graveyard, maybe just wants to wait, cast the Burning Inquiry, and, and then kind of see how that goes. Maybe casting things after, maybe not, depending on how his hands end up looking. Mm. Boy, Bowmasters versus Burning Inquiry is um, a pretty wild interaction. <laughs> oh, that's true. You're right. Maybe Miles feels like because of the Bowmasters, he's unable to go for the Burning Inquiry, even given the Asala one, just he doesn't want to lose his Flame Blade adept. So instead, he's just going to deploy the Detective Phoenix and a second Flame Blade, uh, keep it in hand, hit his opponent for a bunch of damage. Pretty reasonable line. Uh, Honestly, this Hollow One deck is very vulnerable to Bowmasters. It, it just doesn't have that many ways to kill it. Uh, the only interaction in the Hollow One deck are four Bowmasters and four Lightning Bolts. And if you don't have one of those, the Bowmasters is going to stick. And this is sort of the price Miles pays uh, for kind of deploying his, his Bowmasters onto, rather than waiting on it to kill on opposing Bowmasters, is that now he kind of doesn't want to cast his Burning Inquiry. Henry's debating whether or not he wants to block the the walking flame blade adept. And Miles would love that. He would be ecstatic to trade his flame blade adept for this bowmasters. Uh, you know, he, that would turn his burning inquiry, turn his hollow one. Uh, it would let him proc the flame blade adept that remains a lot of times. Uh, if Miles could choose how his opponent blocks, he would certainly choose the double block. Indeed, and that's what happens. And to be clear, in Henry's defense, you know, he, he doesn't know what's in Miles' hand. From his perspective, he might just be thinking something like, look, like, if my opponent had a Burning Query, they might have just done something like bestow Phoenix plus cast Burning Query that turn, uh, thereby growing the flame they'd have out of range of the Bowmaster kill. Um, so while they might have it, I'm not so sure. Uh, maybe just go for the trade, take out the, the scary creature. These flame blade are no joke. Uh, they can often hit for four, five, even six or seven damage in this Hollow One deck. Well, uh, the jig's up. Uh, looking at the hand cam for Henry, he has both another Bowmasters and Unearth, should he want to rebuy the dead one. Mm, I see. <laughs> You're, you are indeed right. So what Henry's actually thinking is, look, like, I don't really need two Bowmasters. One is enough to, to prevent the burning crate. And in fact, trading off my first one might bait my opponent into casting the second one, uh, not knowing that it's actually duped. <laughs> Hmm. Henry look with... at that. Surveilling the grave crawler. Brilliant. Just how we drew it up. This is this is the deck that makes people feel smart. Yes, this is that's what I would love to do. I would love to bin the card that plays out of the graveyard. That that just feels great. Here's that unearth I mentioned. Bowmasters comes in, pings, grows the orcish army, and things are looking bad for miles. Yeah, I mean, okay, so you are right that I don't love the situation for Miles. That said, okay, but there's some silver lining, uh, twofold. First of all, if he just finds the answer to the Bowmasters, his hand is still very good. I know he needs to kill the Bowmasters, I know he needs to, like, clear the way, but, like, let's say he draws Lightning Bolt. He goes, Lightning Bolt of the Bowmasters, cast Burning Inquiry, play Hollow One, pump my thing a bunch. It's only in the driver's seat. It wouldn't take that much. Uh, second silver lining. Uh, although... The Bowmasters is very scary because the Flame Adept has four toughness. He could cast Ring and Crete into it. Now, I know that's terrifying. You grow the Orc Army a lot, you take a bunch of damage, and maybe it's too terrifying, but if, if the chips are down, worst comes to worst, it's not impossible. Oof. Fatal Push takes out the bestowed Flame Blade, flame blade Adept. Leaves a Detective Phoenix in its wake. And a path back 
Uh, Miles does not want to pull the trigger on that burning inquiry. Yeah. Now that the fortunate creature is taken out, it's it's uh, pretty pretty bad. And Orcish Orcish Bowmasters has been uh, really good on camera today. I mean, it's a great card. I mean, many thought it was one of the strongest cards of modern before MH3 released. Uh, MH3 definitely put a whole lot of power into the format. Uh, definitely caused the card stonks to fall a bit, but still an incredibly powerful card. Another unearth finishes off the Detective Phoenix after a block. Miles down to five, facing lethal on the next turn. Yeah, and with him unable to cast putting three the Bowmasters, I don't exactly know how he's going to be able to get out of this. Uh, all of his explosive turns are kind of predicated on drawing a lot of cards, discarding a lot of cards. That's the line option here, and we're going to the next game. Yeah, Miles says, I'm not going to show you anything else. Let's go. All right, let's take a peek at these sideboards. So for the Rakdos deck, anything you like, anything that stands out to you? Yeah, so I assume you mean the Hollow One deck, as, as I guess the, 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 the combo deck also has Goblin Department. But uh, yeah. yes, the Hollow One deck, uh, I think definitely, if I were them, the main thing I want to do is put in some answers to Bowmasters. I mean, I know it sounds obvious, but look like... That's the best card in the deck against you. You can board in more removal for it. You probably should. These Fatal Pushes are going to come in. Uh, Pyroclasm is a pretty clean answer to it. That's probably coming in. Uh, maybe Thoughtseize, maybe Toxic Deluge. Those I'm less sure about. Miles could have them. He could not. Uh, it's it's less clear. Uh, I also think Surgical Extraction might come in. Because fundamentally, Henry Mayer's deck is a combo deck that operates from the graveyard. That You know, you have to sacrifice Gravecrawler to do your thing. And if you sacrifice Gravecrawler with the treasure making on the stack, uh, the Hollow One deck can surgical you. That stops your combo forever. Uh, seems worth having it the, the one of in. Maybe you had three or four. It would, you wouldn't necessarily want all of them. But yeah, I like surgical to, to do that. So that's that's probably what I see from Hollow One. Uh, as far as what gets cut, it's a little harder to say. Uh, historically, the Hollow One deck would sometimes trim Burning Inquiries post board. Also, maybe some of these more expensive cards in a faster matchup might get trimmed as well. Uh, on the mono black side, I think the sideboarding is less clear to me. Um, I think that it looks like Henry has one copy of Force of Despair in the sideboard. I think that's actually probably quite good here. Uh, it's definitely in his sideboard for nodding. Uh, he didn't play it, considering Hollow One. But Think about this. Your opponent casts Burning Inquiry, slams three copies follow him to play, and you force the spirit to kill all of them. I mean, that is an insane turn. Uh, so, yeah, I would definitely expect the, the force the spirit to come in. Beyond that, I'm not sure. Henry doesn't have a lot of slam dunks in his sideboard for this matchup. Uh, you know, Dark Confidant is kind of whatever. Mage Mage is a hate card for another matchup. Uh, Meat Hook Massacre you could have, but... I don't know if you really want that. It's it's a bit slow, and their creatures are pretty large to sweep with a toughness based sweeper. So I, I I'm I'm pretty unsure how he's going to sideboard. I wouldn't be surprised to see him not change too much. Indeed. Um, all right, I'm going to pitch a crazy idea, and I want you to tell me what you think. What if, what if the Hollow One deck cuts literally all of its Goblin Lords and Burning Inquiries? and goes into Thought Seasons and Fatal Pushes as control. Mm, I'm worried there aren't enough slots to manage it. I mean, I see the mouse boarding a lot of cards, so maybe if it's something crazy, I don't know, but I'm worried about it. I mean, fundamentally, <laughs> look, if you're boarding out Burning Inquiries and Goblin Lures, you, you kind of also need to cut Hollow One because, well, you can't cast right. anymore. And that's a lot of slots. Do you actually have 12 good cards to board in? I don't know if you do. Maybe. And then, like, after you're cutting all those cards, it's like, is Oxidagnosis still good? Do, do, you need, do you need to cut it because you don't have enough fuel for it? I, I don't know. Mm. I'm a little skeptical, but... You know, Miles would know better than I would. I, I'm not an expert on the Hollow One deck by any way, by any means. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm not either. I was just like, I wonder how he approaches this. And 
those cards are such a liability against Bowmasters. <laughs> yeah, you I would focus on just trying to kill the Bowmasters and trying to hold your Bowmasters' answers to theirs, hold your removal, not not spend them on anything else. Uh, kind of change the way I play to many Bowmasters Masters rather than changing the way my deck is configured. But sure. I, but you know, it's the, the approach of changing the deck isn't isn't out of the question. Um, and I mean, I especially think it's common for all one to cut Burning Queen. Okay, Burning Queen's card is an inch. And your opponent's deck uses the graveyard. So, like, I definitely wouldn't be surprised to see Miles trim or even cut entirely Burning Inquiry. It's Goblin lore, really, that I think he's going to leave. Sure. Well, players are looking at their game two hands. Miles will be on the play since Henry won game one. Took a rather long mulligan there. We're going to start with Swamp and the Thoughtseize. So Miles did bring in Thoughtseize, and Henry says, here are all of my magic cards. I mean, this is a pretty Thoughtseize-proof hand. Uh, obviously, taking Gravecrawlers accomplishes nothing. You can take Nihil Spellbomb, protect your Detective Phoenixes, I suppose. But honestly, that card's pretty marginal. It's fine for me to board in, because, I don't know, it's like a clean two-for-one, and you can get the Ox, I suppose. But... It's not, like, an exciting card, uh, but I guess out of this hand, maybe it's the pick? Uh, yeah, I, I think if I'm if I'm Miles, I would definitely consider taking that spell bomb if my hand had Nether Goyce or Ox in it. Yeah. I mean, also, it's just, like, you don't, have, you don't really have many good options. I mean, I guess you could take the Unearth, because, like, at some future point, you, it, might, it might recurse Old Trader, uh... Especially if your hand is removal heavy, maybe that's what you'd pick, something like that. But it's not any exciting options. Sure. Hmm. Miles down to 18 ops for the unearth. And Henry's turn one is the Neil Oh, is a great crawler that we saw just a moment ago. Yep, he's gonna start the beats, get get some pressure going. Uh obviously he's gonna end at least some games with a combo, but his deck has a pretty legitimate aggro plan, and two Savannah Lions are not to be trifled with. All right. That's really basic. And we see Inti, Seneschal of the Sun, hit the table for miles. Uh, this card, pretty scary in this shell. Uh, Street Wraith gets a free card with Inti. Uh, Burning and Queen Goblin Lore both get free cards as well. A uh, lot of ways to kind of get your value. And, yeah, also just a good way to get Detective Phoenix and its ilk into the art. Yeah, this card is sweet. I like that a lot. Uh, Miles passes back to Henry. And Henry, on his second turn, <laughs> serves in. It's not going to block, so let's attack. Miles knows that Henry has second grave crawler, so I'm not exactly sure what this pause is. Uh, he... he... It would be sort of crazy for him to do anything other than take it. Uh, given that, you know, if he blocks, Henry Mirror can just go Gravecrawler, bring back Gravecrawler. Uh, maybe, does he have Surgical? Is that what he's thinking? Hmm. Not sure. I don't know. We have not had a good look at Miles' hand yet. Uh, Spy Master's Vault comes down for Henry. And that's Flare of Malice. Yeah, the Flare of Malice hits the table. Uh, in response, Miles gets to Cycle Street Wraith, and then he can cast Lightning Bolt until the end of his next turn. Pretty nice tech. Uh, that is how it works, indeed. <laughs> Had to be good to double check that, but as anyone who's played a lot of Slogurk knows, uh, that, that, that is how it works. Um, and Flare is definitely, it's, it's a new card in MH3. Uh, I think was very hyped when the set was first spoiled. Didn't ever really materialize as much as some people wanted, but it's a pretty nice way to answer specifically Nadu uh, without targeting it, without giving them a free card. And it also fits very nicely into a show with Gravecrawler, since Gravecrawler is good to sack, comes back for free, uh, all pieced together pretty nicely. Absolutely. Miles on his third turn. He's not attacking with that Lightning Bolt. It's exiled. At the moment, he does have the ability to cast it should he want to. Touch for a swamp. Hmm. 
Is that a swamp? No, that's not. Two. No, no. I mean, Miles could try to, like, kill both Grey Crocs, and I hope that Henry doesn't have another zombie to kind of get the chain back started. But instead, no, he's going to send the bolt upstairs, say, look, these game colors are probably just around forever. Your deck is full of zombies. I, I, I'm just going to take my three damage. Back to Henry on his third turn. Looking to send four damage at Miles. That's a third of Miles' life total. But Bowmasters comes in. We're going to change Yeah, it, it might not be any of, of Miles' life total, as it turns out. Bowmaster's trigger, nicks one Grave Crawler in the middle of combat, and then Orcish Army sits in front of the other. If this works, it's gonna it's gonna kneecap Henry's game plan. Right, so this is a big check here. The question is, does Henry have another zombie? If he does, then this was a fine maneuver to buy time, but nothing that's really gonna change the game. If he doesn't, this might be devastating. Indeed. Henry's in the tank post-combat. Oh, jeez. His hand is Soul Trader, Millswellum, and Lance. Not exciting. No, it is not. So... One thing you might be thinking about here is, okay, a Warden Soul Trader, famously, is a zombie. That's how the combo works. But it would be a lot better if you could play it, and then immediately, before they get a chance to remove it, put a Gravecrawler onto the stack. Uh, that way, your second Gravecrawler is always going to be capable of being cast. So what Henry's thinking about here is, should he just play the Soul Trader out, or should he play Nail Spell Bomb, be patient, and next turn go Soul Trader into immediate Gravecrawler? That's a tough decision, and it's going to change the course of this game, regardless which way he takes. Deep in the tank. We are near the bottom of the tank. And you can see Henry shaking his head a bit, because he knows he's not in a great position right now. He's not pleased with this line. He thinks the right play is full on the Soul Trader. He's going to do that, but... He's now just kind of crossing his fingers and hoping Miles' turn isn't too explosive. Yep. Just Neil Sovon from Henry and a pass. Back over to Miles. Now, one thing I want to bring up here is all right, we know that Henry doesn't have Bowmasters, but Miles doesn't know that. And Henry passing with two mana up kind of represents Bowmasters. <laughs> mm. A long tank was a head fake. Miles bestows Detective's Phoenix onto um, in in Tali? In Tali? In Wait, I, Inti. I, I don't think I've ever said that word out loud. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's fine. I've, I've, I've said it a lot. And then uh, attacks. Re and reveal the thought seed from Inti. Now, now look look at this. So Miles discarded his, his redundant copy of Inti to put a counter on the Bowmasters. Now, this is interesting because most cards he flips here, he can't cast. You know, it's it's like if he, if he flips any card that costs greater than a one. He's, he's not going to be able to cast it, and he's just going to be kind of be down a card hand for nothing. So to me, this shows that Henry really wants to push the tempo. He really wants to get the game over with. He knows that these, these great powers are going to come back sooner or later, and he wants to get Henry dead as soon as possible. He doesn't want to give him time to get his combo going, to get these great crawlers back. Yeah. Miles' well, last card was a shock land, which uh, was used to cast the Thought Seize, previously exiled by Inti's ability. Henry fetches up a Surveil Land, Raukus Theater. I mean, that was a huge Thought Seize from us. I mean, I, I have to imagine that was the best possible flip for him in that spot. <clears throat> Agreed. 
he's got a surveil on the stack. He's debating whether or not to crack the Neil spell bomb just to get another look at a card. Hmm. Yeah. So. All right. His card was Stitcher Supplier, it looks like. And he's going to bin it because, frankly, that is not good enough. Henry needs better than Stitcher Supplier. He could cast it. He could get back both Grave Crawlers. That's all well and good. But that isn't going to race Miles Bort. <laughs> Side effect of the spell bomb is that Miles gets to make an Orcish army again. Yeah, Bowmaster is definitely a real uh, theme of this event so far. Been doing a lot of work out of a lot of different decks. Hmm. Every round, I'm. <laughs> I'll be watching the rest of the coverage today when uh, when the other casters take over. Just to see if Bowmasters continues to dominate this tournament. Yeah, at some point I expect to get a, a few more birds on camera, which might uh, reduce the frequency of that. But you know, we'll see. All um, right, we find Unearth. So Henry rebuilds. He's got a formidable board, and his opponent is at eight. Eight is, unfortunately, one more than the amount of power Henry has. Uh, although, maybe Spymaster's Vault could make up that difference? Let's see, because he, he can pull some pretty interesting tricks here with Spymaster's Vault. <clears throat> for, for example, uh, he could block something with the Soul Trader. He could sack a... Grave crawler, and then he could use the connive to try to grow the soul trader to win a, a combat. Is an example of an option Henry has here. Now, I guess given that the anti flies, maybe none of this matters. But it's important to consider. I mean, the the spider is very strong in this shell. Let's see what he does. Hen Henry at nine life, facing. A bunch of damage and two out of three uh, of Henry's creatures cannot block. Miles with one card in hand, debating the best course of action. Yeah, it seems like he's deciding whether to discard this card to empty. All right, he's going to. All right, so Wasn't Bowmaster is now a 3 3. Bowmaster is also a 3 3. So, it, so Henry could. Trade up to trade his soul masters for the bowmasters. Now, if he chooses to sack his his uh raid crawler, can I on the spy master? Unfortunately, given the bowmaster will then ping, it seems like that doesn't really get him anywhere, but it is an option. Uh alternatively, he could just take the hit, but then he falls dangerously low. He would fall to two. Uh <laughs> Okay, he's going to block. Interesting. I think it was just a chump. Post combat, detect his Phoenix cast. Without the salt, see, here's the thing. I'm not sure I understand that block because what's Henry's out now? Before, I think we told people like peel the combo, but now. I don't know what Henry can do. What's the what's the plan? He took out the bowmaster, which means he can connive without taking pings. Um, now that is nice, but how is he going to survive the next turn? He doesn't. He isn't. It was all, it was all ruse. <laughs> Henry says, "All right, you got me. We're going to game three. Right up one and one is Hollow One, Rectus Hollow One deck versus the mostly mono black aggro. Um, this is another one of those uh, it, uh, decks with a combo just 
incidentally inside of it, right? It's it's kind of like a Racto Sacrifice deck from Days of Yore, but it's got a three card combo in a couple of different configurations and a lot of uh, reanimation effects via Unearth and Cathernian Nightmare. Yes, they, they sort of help you assemble the pieces. They, they act as kind of, I don't know, pseudo tutors in combination with the Citrus Supplier of Self Mill. Hmm. Yeah. This looks like in, a fun deck. In general, I have some concerns. Um, and specifically, my concerns around Henry's deck are okay, I buy this combo aspect. I like that, you know. I have this combo, it works well in the graveyard, there's a bunch of redundant pieces because it can work with Varian Apprentice or Goblin Bombardment. Uh, I like that you can unearth to buy back dead pieces or to help you assemble pieces that you've milled over. All that stuff is cool. My worry is... The game seems a bit mopey to me. I mean, a lot of Henry's creatures are not really up to snuff in, in you know, compared to a modern power level. Uh, compared to something like the Boros Energy deck, you know? Henry's turn is on turn one, he plays a 2-1. On turn one of the Boros Energy play take, plays a 1-1 one, one first strike that makes a 1-1 one, one every turn of the game, and also, by the way, at some point it makes two of them. You know, it's like, one of these things is not like the others. And then on two, it's like Henry's deck plays, you know, a Orcish Bowmasters, and his opponent plays a Johnny. I don't know. I'm worried that his fair game is a bit anemic, but I definitely like how good he's assembling the combo. So I don't know. It's, it's a mix, it's a mixed back. Mm -hmm. mm. I noticed Miles while he was uh, glancing at his sideboard there that he did in fact take that plan that I proposed earlier, where he boarded out most or all of his burning inquiries in Goblin um, Goblin Wars. Interesting. Those, yeah. Those cards I mean, are all in the sideboard. I mean, that is wild. It's it's gonna mean his deck is gonna play really fair. <laughs> but we'll 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 see. I mean, maybe <laughs> man, that, that, that's gonna make things real strange. <laughs> We're just gonna see two kind of mopey decks <laughs> kind of interact with each other and play mid-range fights. Oh some good magic to be had, certainly. Yeah, modern's been kind of like that, you know, forever though, right? Like <laughs> these combo decks, they run into interaction, and then it takes fifteen turns to resolve. Oh, definitely true. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like Henry's taking a mulligan. I, I think there's a weird dynamic amount that often happens where, because what all the decks are doing is so fundamentally messed up, no one can play like, top-end to mid-range end games that really, you know, close the door. Like, you can't play a Traxa in Modern, really, unless you're, like, cheating it out. You can't hard-cast expensive cards. And so because everyone's deck is so nimble and so lean, once you have all this interaction, the game goes long, you end up playing a pretty good, grindy game with some really nice magic. All right. Looks like Miles also opted for a mulligan. It's only fair. Both players get to start at six. These uh, MDFC cards change the, the land math quite a bit for decks like these, especially the mostly monocolored decks, yeah? Yeah, definitely to some extent. I think, I think you are right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, mostly I think players just kind of free roll these lands, that is, count them as lands, occasionally you cast those spells, but, you know, if you're asking, like, what percentage of a land one of these uh, lands is, I think the answer is upwards of 75%. It's a, it's a pretty large amount. Yep. Mm. Both players keeping their six. Henry will be on the... Oh, just kidding. I got a head fate. Miles, going back for five. Uh, Henry will be on the play as he lost game two. This is this will be the match for uh, round four. Uh, both players are three and zero at this time, so off to a good start. And I think uh, what you saw there um, was Miles potentially playing the price uh, for kind of the sideboard plan because I only got a brief glimpse of his hand, but it looked to me like he had 
a hollow one and no way to kind of cost reduce it. And he decides, look, at that point, the hollow one's kind of a dead card. I, I might as well go to five. But, well, you sort of put yourself in this position. Um, it's the cost you pay for the sideboard play. Mm -hmm. I think Miles brought in Rakdos Charm as well. Well, the Rakdos Charm is sort of reasonable, right? He can use the Exile Opposing Graveyard mode to break up Henry's combo and to just get rid of any pesky Gravecrawlers that might be hanging around. It's not perfect, but it isn't horrible. It's a bit inefficient, a bit awkward. You could do worse. Absolutely. All right. Here we go. Six cards versus five. Henry on the play. Arch Flats getting Blood Crypt. 17 already. It's modern. And I'm just going to mention this now. Uh, it seems like there might be an issue where Light Souls might be frozen just for a minute or two here. Uh, it, it, the issue is fixed, but there's going to be a brief delay. So just letting people know that, uh, yeah, Hen we are aware that Henry is not a 20. <laughs> Spinter Supplier milled three cards, Flare of Malice, a Boggart Crawler, and something else. I think that's Cthonian Nightmare. Not a great hand, not an awful hand, I think. I do some nice work with the Cthonian Nightmare, but doesn't have it kind of fully assembled just yet. Mm, would really like to, you know, get back Soul Trader, for instance, get back Marionette Apprentice. Mm. I guess one option available to Henry is to play Cthonia Nightmare, stack Citrus Supplier, and just put a 3-1 on the table. Uh, it's not inspiring, but it's not horrible. Does advance the game state. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he's going to choose to do that. Um, it's not again. It's not an, an awesome play. Maybe he would rather just like have the clear nightmare and wait for a better moment. Maybe we'd rather make some other play uh, that is you know develops his board without stacking his Sinister Supplier. I I'm not sure, but I don't think it would be crazy from just play the nightmare, get back Bogart Trawler, build a few more cards towards his combo pieces, and see how things go. Henry pokes Miles for one with the Stitcher's Supplier. Back into the tank we go. Nice to see some things never change. Henry's a bit of a thinker. We're going to take three damage for, from our MDFC and cast something. Problem bombardment. All right. So choosing instead of playing Throne Nightmare and putting a 3 into play to play the Bombardment, and now Henry sort of just has a ping whenever he wants it. At some point, he can convert this Stitcher to a ping, uh, and the timing of that is up to him. Low hand for Miles. Mulligan to 5 didn't seem to do him many favors. Turn 3 for Henry. My totals have been updated. Miles will be at 18 after this. Henry at 14. Mark Flats on a pass. Imagine Miles probably has a surveillance in this deck. He does. Raucous Theater. Yeah, so Miles having a, a bit of a slower draw here, not not getting up to much. It, it seems like his hand has a lot of kind of reactive cards, would be my guess. <clears throat> and I guess, again, this, this all comes back to the sideboard play to some extent, right? Uh, if the more Rakdos charms, the more removal spells, the more cards of that nature you have, the less you're going to be playing the board in the early turns. That might be okay. 
Uh, it doesn't seem like Henry's really, you know, pumping the gas pedal either, but it, it certainly is a price. Here's a good look at Miles's hand. I see Paraclasm following, Rectus Charm, and I believe a Fatal Push. Yeah, that, 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 that I think is absolutely right. So, in other words, all interaction and a 5-mana 4-4. Four, four. Um. Perfect. Detective Phoenix comes in, but it's going to going to die mid combat. It looks like there was a ping without audio. It's hard to tell until he actually moves the card. Yes, uh, there's a ping from the Bowmasters and a sacrifice of the bombardment to finish it off. That's going to incidentally mill Henry for three. He's not too mad about that. And he's going to find a second Bowmaster. So now, uh, for instance, he could play Nightmare, sack his Orc army, get back Bowmasters, make a new Orc army. Um, pretty appealing option. Sounds like fun to me. And Henry fetches up a uh, Surveillance at end step. Let's see if we get another bonus card in the graveyard. Something I also want to call attention to here is that we in the booth, with our from our ominous perspective, know... That Miles boarded out all his burning crazy and goblin lords. Henry doesn't know that. Now, he might suspect that after not seeing one all game two. You know, I, I'm, he's a strong player, and I, I believe that it's possible he's he's kind of sniffed out what's going on. But it's also possible that he he hasn't. And if not, he's going to really want to get all these bowmasters onto the table because he wants to stop his opponent from casting goblin lord burning inquiry. Uh, th this is this is the interesting aspect of this, right? We don't know how much Henry knows. <laughs> Indeed, the the caster's dilemma. Okay, Tithoni Nightmare and Mutavolt enter the battlefield for Henry's fourth turn. We first pick up some energy, and then we're going to eyeball our graveyard. And he did just what you said. Yep. More bonus. I mean, this play's pretty strong. It's it's kind of just a free bowmaster. You get a ping, the token comes back, you're up a body. Why not? Hmm. And we're going to replay the Nightmare, sack the Orc army, and get Bogart Trawler exiling Detectives Phoenix. <laughs> Bonus. Nice little turn from Henry here. I, I, this is a, a good line, I think. Oh, hmm. yeah, absolutely. Henry with just two cards left in hand. We in the booth and you at home know that there's a pyroclasm in Miles' hand. Henry doesn't. Yeah. Like that. I mean, obviously pyroclasm is good. It cleans up Henry's board. Miles will take three damage for his trouble, though. You're right. That's not insignificant, especially with the Muta Vault still left on the field. Yeah. What do you think about that mutable? It, it might end up being fuel for the nightmare. <laughs> you know, I, I think a pretty plausible turn for Henry, assuming he doesn't have another creature lined up, is he could do something just like animate mutable, play nightmare, nightmare sacks mutable, get back bowmasters would be an example turn. Miles with four in hand, Henry with two, nightmare comes back down. Up to four energy. All right. Activates mutable. Yep. Here we go. <laughs> like we're back into the scotch. Ah, uh, he wants to. So here's the deal. He, what he wants to do is he's animating Mutavolt and he wants to cast Grave Call off it before he uses Cthonia Nightmare. And this is a good play. And the reason it's a good play is if the opponent has a rule for the Mutavolt, you still can sack the, the Grave Caller so you're no worse off. You can have anything else to do with that man anyway. If the opponent doesn't have a rule for the Mutavolt, then it's you're just up a Grave Crawler. It's a free roll. Mm. Fantastic. Henry at 13, Miles at 11, Goblin Bombardment, 
Changes the map a little bit for Miles. Yeah, he's definitely in danger of dying to just O Master pings, Bombardment pings, hits for a couple points. Ship damage is really adding up here. That said, I do think the Rakdos Triumphs has might be decisive here. Can really shut down the Chthonian Nightmare and buy Miles a lot of time to figure out some sort of answer to these small creatures. Miles down to seven after a combat step. Henry has Chthonian Nightmare in hand and I believe three other cards that we don't know. And they're not lands, because he didn't play a land last turn. So he has he has spells we don't know specifically. I'd say Henry's favorite to take this match just based on what I'm seeing right now. Well, maybe. I mean, what's about to happen is going to be a big, pretty big bow out, right? Yeah. In response to the Nightmare Activation... <laughs> This turn. Yeah. Yeah, the token was sacrificed to, to get back the Bowmaster. The Bowmaster is not going to get back. Tony Nightmare is still bounced. All of your graveyard is exiled. I mean, I know Miles is at seven. I know there's a bombardment in play. I'm not saying he's out of the woods, but I think he's got a shot here. I mean, losing that graveyard is big. Oh, it's a grave crawler. That's a good one for Henry. Yeah, that's going to be a problem, since now Miles is dead in roughly two hits. It's a, it's a little tricky, uh, but probably 3-3-1 three, three, will be lethal. Mm. Yeah, I think Miles was tanking on whether or not to crack that wood in foothills. Yeah, he decides yeah. he can't afford to, which might be right, but also it's going to be hard to get out of this with only three mana to work with. Miles with get another draw and pass. Here's the beat down. It's Henry Romero coming over and a lightning bolt on Gravecrawler. Yeah, he doesn't want to kill the Bowmasters because then it will come back, deal a damage, and get a uh, token out of the deal. So instead, we just kill the Gravecrawler and decide look, if you want to play the Nightmare, sack the Bowmaster, get back Gravecrawler, the next turn, finally, back the Bowmasters, all right. Hopefully by that time I'll figure something out. Mm. That said, I'm increasingly worried that I don't know what figure something out is anymore. <laughs> so Miles, Miles is fun. Yeah. And, and the bombardment is a huge problem. I mean, in the long run, he's just always getting burned out. I, I don't know. He's just something powerful and fast. Miles is going to go down to four. He's functionally at three, just with what's on the battlefield. Oh, he's functionally less than three. <laughs> oh, because of the... Uh, well, I guess it doesn't uh, how you count. Grave but... crawler, yeah. grave crawler, bombardment. We're done here. Miles wraps it up. Henry Romero advances to four and oh. Good start for him. Yeah. Miles on three and one. I don't know. I just I keep coming back to the sideboard thing. It, it just Miles Depp didn't look very functional in that game. I, I, he didn't do anything. You're right, and that plan that I kind of shot in the dark and, and weirdly ended up being right was mostly just a hey, I've got ten reasonable sideboard cards here. Is he going to bring in all of those things? Turns out he did, and then he paid the price for it because he couldn't do the thing that his deck normally does. Right. Like, what happened is he diluted his main plan to the point where his opponent, like, Henry Mero never comment. You know, he, he didn't do that at all. All he did was, like, look, given that you weren't in this weird control deck, I can just beat you with recurring nightmare and goblin bombardment. And I just can't help but thinking, look, like, I know Bowmaster is a problem, and I know finding a spot where it's not in play and you can play your Goblin Lords is hard, but at least then you're hitting them with like six power hasty flyers and like, you know, getting getting all these free cards off Inti and you're really going to town. It's like, now what ended up happening is you just kind of lost two anemic beats. Uh, you know, you solved the <laughs> Bowmaster problem, but but at what price? Uh, so, yeah. Um, anyways, at least we got entertaining magic out of it. Oh, no, no. That was a great game. I... And I like watching mid-range grindfests. 
<laughs> I'm just worried that Midnight Grand Fest wasn't the game that uh, he wanted to play there. Anyways, uh, my understanding is that we, we do have some more magic for you. I'm told that we will have a backup match, game two, uh, between Boros Energy and Just High Control. Uh, some of the classic modern archetypes to come out of MH3. Yeah, uh, we've seen a couple of variations on this Boros Energy deck already today. Uh, it's super popular. Um, I'll take a peek to see how many people are on this type of deck in just a minute. But uh, how does it? How do you think this plays out, especially with Boros up a game? Uh, yeah, I mean. It's sort of a classic uh, mid-range against control matchup. Uh, the Jessica control deck will be quite inevitable. And it's up to the board's energy deck to get the Jeskai control deck low enough in time. And when I say in time, what I mean is, at some point, the Jessica control deck is going to put the one ring onto this stack. This will happen sooner or later. When it does, if the Jessica control deck is at 20, the game is over. If they're at 5, not so clear. And so what the what the Boris Energy needs to do is to mitigate the ring through the mechanism of life total damage. Uh, and what the control deck wants to do is trade cards repeatedly so that when the ring comes down, they are still at a high life total. That's that's pretty much it. That's the dynamic. The one ring is the most important card in this matchup, and a lot is going to revolve around it. Um now, now the Boris Energy does have some reach, like once it gets its opponent low, you can finish them off with Gobble Bombardment, you can finish them off with Flip to Johnny, Flage Damage can finish them off. There's some tools to, to end things if you get them low. But if they're too high, then you're not going to overcome the garbage of the ring. It's just not possible. All right. Mm -hmm. So looks like we've shaped up this game so far. We've guided of souls into a pair of dual lands from the Jeskai Control deck completely expected. Um, so Duke now at, I believe, 17. And a pass. And this is not the start you dream of as Boris Energy. I mean, it looks like his opening was just one drop into Tapland Go. I mean, obviously, you got to keep what you got to keep, and it's a grindy matchup. You can't afford to mulligan much, but you can't be happy about this if you're in Ben's seat. I took a peek at the deck list just now, and Benjamin's uh, Boros Energy deck has a couple of interesting choices in it. It does look a little heavier in the three spot. There's two Fable of the Mirror Breaker, a pair of Blood Moon, and then a Dewdrop Cure from Bloomborough. Yeah, Fable of the Mirror Breaker is a card that has often appeared in these Jeskai lists in kind of small numbers. Uh, usually, it, it ends up getting shade for space in the blacklist, either because of Omnixilis or just because they prefer more cheap black cards such as Bowmaster that you don't have access to. Uh, but it's not it's not unusual to see it in in a small numbers in the Boros in the straight Boros lists. Uh, the Blood Moons. Uh, this is technology that I believe was. Uh, pioneered by Pro Tour topic competitor Benton Madsen, who won one of the one back PTQs at Pro Tour Amsterdam with main deck Blood Moon Boros Energy. Uh, I don't know the full implications of this, uh, kind of that is, say, what it's for, where it really shines, but it is very nice that it kills Urza Sagas out of Nadu, which is obviously the deck on everyone's minds. Uh, against Jeskai, it's kind of whatever. You might leave in Blood Moon, but if you do, it's not that exciting. It's a card right the borderline of probably one of the worst cards in your deck, but might be good enough to not side out. <clears throat> Those are some basic lands on Duke's side. Those are the Phyrexian All Will Be One Oil Slick Plains. And there's oh the Secret Rear Blood Moon. <laughs> well, so, okay. Blood Moon is landed. We left it in. And our opponent has, unfortunately, two basics in play. So does this Blood Moon matter? Well, yes, it stops them casting double-colored cards of various sorts. You know, they aren't, they aren't going to be casting Counterspell off a single island. They aren't going to be casting Wrath of Skies off a single Plains. But about half their deck is still perfectly castable. Indeed. Oh, Celestial Purge out of Duke Lee solves Blood Moon. And then... That is yeah, so turn the two the narrative. Now we've got a pretty big check because 
if you're Duke and you have a sweeper, I would assume you're going to fire it off on these three creatures, right? I don't think you're going to wait for more value. The question now is, does Duke have it? Uh, now, he has three Wrath of in the main deck. There's also a couple of backup cyborg sweepers, such as Brotherhood's End and Supreme Verdict, which might have come in. Uh, hard to say. Mm. Oh. Or there's the One Ring. Remember how before I was talking about what two Slipes will when the One Ring comes down is a really important variable? Uh, 15 is a lot. Indeed. I'm going to take a peek at Ben's hand. That's another Blood Moon. Table of the Mirror Breaker, Static Prison, and a Land of some sort. Well, the Static Prison, okay, it's not perfect. They still buy a turn to draw a card, but you can use that to handle the ring. It's not awesome, but it, it gives you a shot. And there it is. You click his ring before it disappears temporarily. Oh, that's not a yeah. one. That was a plague. Pardon me. I think uh, that is the theme of the Table comes down. We're going to get an energy from Guide of Souls. We're going to. There's a goblin token that'll eventually make its way onto the battlefield. You can't get any damage through, but going to attack and, and put counters on our Guide of Souls since you can only leave that once per turn. So, given how much energy Ben has, he's like, yeah, I'll get one in now, maybe do another one next turn. Makes enough sense. Are we already at the City's Blessing? Uh, well, we're not far from it if we're not there. No, I see. I see. Yeah. In, in that case, we get a bonus goblin token, right? I think we're still looking for a token to represent that. Um... Sure, but when we find goblin token, because we also <laughs> trying triggered, triggered with the city's blessing, it's going to make a cat and a goblin. That's the point. Right. Yep. And you are correct. Two goblins. Duke, if you've got a removal spell or a sweeper spell, I think you should use it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, from Ben's perspective, I mean, this forced the sweeper as, as hard as he possibly can. And what I like about how Ben has played this is, so he is forcing the sweeper by playing the Fable, but also, let's say that Duke has the sweeper, it's not necessarily the end of the world, especially if it's a sweeper that only hits creatures, like a not a Wrath of Sky sort of thing. If it's just like Supreme Verdict, then... All right, I mean, Duke untaps, he can loot away the Flage, he can flash it back pretty soon, he still has the Fable, he's okay. If it's Wrath of the Skies, which notably will hit Fable, then he's in trouble. Because Wrath of the Skies will also, like, bring back the One Ring, like, a lot goes wrong if Duke has Wrath of the Skies. Yeah. Duke's asking some questions, just assessing everything at 13 due to a shock land that he deployed on this turn. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's fine. Just... <laughs> I think we're double checking with totals, so is what we're checking. No, no. I mean, I think you're right. I more was thinking, like, I'm looking at Duke's face. <laughs> I. I don't think he drew the Wrath of the Sky. I don't think he has the Wrath of the Skies. But it's the face of a person with no Wrath of the Skies. Yeah. That's my analysis. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I can't... I, I, his hand is a lot of special alt art cards, which is making it a bit difficult for me to identify what he has. Uh, I, I don't think he has Wrath of the Skies. Still assessing, assessing all threats. I see a subtlety, I believe, in Duke's hand. Yeah, I think he's a subtlety. I think there might be a flage in there, but that isn't that exciting either. A solitude. I mean, it's all whatever. Yeah, Ben gets to untap with his massive board. Fables in play, plenty of energy. Ocelot Pride is going to continue to work its magic. 
this is very bad for Duke. Mm -hmm. Well, the Mirror Breaker plays nice with excess lands and flage out of the hand. Yep. Uh, kind of a full divination there, if you will. Not suspicious at all that Duke shocked himself and then did nothing. Not suspicious at all. Yeah, I mean, Ben, ben should know the player in Solitude here. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty face up. Uh, yeah, if, I, if I'm Ben, I'm going to attack in such a way that I basically assume I'm going to Solitude, but I mean, that isn't, it's not that unnatural an attack, to be clear. Like, the Ocelot Pride can still get in, you just put counters on it and give it flying if you want. Um, or you could leave it home and attack with you know, the rest of their creatures and give, like, a Goblin Shaman flying or something. I don't know. <laughs> it kind of always goes well for you. Oh, he's actually beginning of combat solitude with Guided Souls to prevent the counters. This makes sense, but now Ben certainly knows the solitude is there. The dig is up, as they say. Um, Blood Moon did come down for Ben. And Duke notice, uh, notably has three different uh, non-basics, so... Currently, Duke has white, white, red, red, red. Those are the mana that he has access to next turn. Wait, are those both planes, or is one an island? I believe those are both planes. Okay, you might be right, sorry. <laughs> Look, I, I'm pretty good at identifying some of the arts. I do not, I, these oil sticks I cannot do, so I'll, I'll defer to your expertise. The, um, those are, they are tough. The symbol is in the center, uh, and it's hard to pick out the bottom one. All right, well, so given that those are both planes, then what's going to end up being the case here is Duke basically needs to peel Wrath of Disguise. Indeed. Yep. We sent some tokens in. We make some more tokens. Yeah, so, so what's happening here, so just to be clear, is so Ben gained life this turn. He gained life off of Solitude. You know, his guidance was in trigger, but Solitude still triggered him. So, what this means is, Ocelot Prides saw him gain life, he has two of them. So both Ocelot Prides make a token. Both Ocelot Prides double tokens. And they both, including doubling the treasure tokens from the Goblin Shamans. So now, as you can see, Ben has like, eight treasures in play. What's he gonna do with all these treasures? I don't know, but he does have them. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not going to name all those things. I'm just going to say there's a lot of stuff on the battlefield right now. Uh, you know, some cat tokens, some goblins, some treasures, static prison, fable the mirror breaker, energy, blood moon. I named most of them. <laughs> I mean, if Duke finds a sweeper here, he still might be okay. He also could potentially find the one, which will guarantee buy him a turn, give him a bunch of looks at that sweeper. He, he's not totally out of it. He's at nine. Flage finishing him off from nine isn't a guarantee. That said, if he doesn't have the one ring and he doesn't have a sweeper, spot removal is, is not going to do it. Like this Flage, look, it's nice. You gain three life. You kill the Ocelot Pride. It, 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 it's totally acceptable. It also isn't going to be good enough. Yeah, absolutely. Next turn. Sorry, go ahead. Duke's at 12 and facing down every token known to, known to man. Yes, and this lifelink blocker uh, can be easily removed by flashing back Flage, but you flash it back, take out the Solitude, attack with all of the tokens, and it is Omega lethal. It's lethal by like 10 points or something. There is a Celestial Purge in Duke's hand. I don't think that plays. It does something, but it's probably not enough. Table transforms. Also, that's going to have like, so many treasures this turn. And just making sure he crosses his T's and dots his I's. Doing a little math. I mean, he does have 
Okay, so we're not going to fly by plane. We're going to leave that to go upstairs. Sure. That's probably still lethal, I would imagine. I can't see exactly how many tokens are there, but it's a very large number. You're trying to math to see if he can block Ocelot Pride and live. <laughs> yeah. Checking it once. We're checking it twice. We're just going to keep on checking it. I mean, but this is 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 gains 3. So he's at 4? Is that right? Wait a minute. Did he? It, it is it, hard to tell. I think Ben may have made a small misstep here. Oh, no. Okay. It's still good. Dude. Okay. Then it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I, I believe you're right. But ultimately, I think the writing was on the wall. Oh, Synergy takes down Just Guy. Control 2 0 in round four. Congrats yeah. to all the players today. Really clutch showing by uh, Static Prism, honestly. Uh, <laughs> that one ring, he was at a high life total, absolutely threatened to take over the game. Uh, if he had seen, you know, six more cards, I suspect, would have found a sweeper to clean everything up. But Static Prism takes it out. They may have gotten a card, they may have bought a turn, but that's just fine. Boris Energy rolls over the finish line. Hmm. All right, great. So uh, we're now going to take a brief break. Uh, rounds five through eight, we'll have a couple other guest hosts for you all. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your Saturday morning with us. If you're in the LA yes. area, stop by the tournament. Uh, Laughing Dragon's a great tournament organizer, and there's plenty of side events. Yeah, and I believe that the remainder of the day will be covered by Hayu and Jason. So you are in great hands. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. It's been a real pleasure. Everyone have a nice day. Later, everyone.